Hi, everyone, and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Today, we are talking about the War of the Five Kings, which is the backdrop, really, to everything we're reading about uh, in the, uh, the Song of Ice and Fire as a whole. It's one of the, the, the kinds of subjects that I love talking about because this is the story that the history books will be writing, but it's not the story that we've always been reading about. The Song of Ice and Fire is a character and plot-driven story rather than one about all of the battles. It's not a huge history book, but these battles are happening and they're important and they are going on in the background and they affect absolutely everything that is happening to the characters that we know. So that's what we're going to be talking about now is kind of the meta-narrative of what is happening in A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, as always, I will try my very best to give a little uh, introduction to start with to some of the things which are happening in the wider world of uh, sort of fantasy uh, TV um, and, and movies. Uh, but first of all, if you are um, in America and you are celebrating a Thanksgiving, then happy Thanksgiving to you. Um, I hope you're having a wonderful time. I think uh, it's a time a lot of people spend with their families, so I hope you're managing to spend some time with yours. Uh, and uh, I hope it's a blessed time for you. Um, what's happening this week in the in the wider world of fantasy TV and, and movies? Well, not huge amounts is the honest answer because the, the big news is still at the moment is the Wheel of Time. Last week it debuted. In fact, it, it, the first three episodes appeared pretty much as I was on air this time last week. So expect episode four, roughly when I finish this live stream, to be appearing uh, as well. The first three episodes, uh, I've watched them all. I'm really enjoying it. Um, the critical reviews have tended to be quite mixed, it has to be said. The the way I would tend to sort of break down from what I've seen of others' views is the hardcore fans love it. This is the thing that they they absolutely adore, and it's, it's on their TV screens. Fantastic. There have been some changes made. Some of them are quite significant. The, they've had to rattle through the story at quite a pace. Uh, but if you are a hardcore fan of Wheel of Time, I'm sure you've already watched it and you probably would hugely enjoy it. If you have read the books and you like them, then maybe you will spot some of the differences and um, you, you, you'll probably like it, is, is what I would say. It's, it's the people who have not come across the Wheel of Time before for them, the feeling I'm getting is a lot of people are thinking it looks amazing. Um, uh, Rosalind Pike does a fantastic performance. Essentially, there is Molly Rain. Um, perhaps it's it's not convinced a few people yet uh, to show that it's different uh, to sort of more generic fantasy stories out there. I, as I say, I am really enjoying it, and I would highly recommend you you try it as well. Uh, do let me know what you think. Um, there's eight episodes in this first season, so as of um, today, we will be halfway through that first season, and they are already filming season two, so we're 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 going to have season two regardless. Other things, uh, just to note, they have finished filming just this week. They have finished filming uh, the Witcher Blood Origin miniseries. This is something I'm personally really looking forward to. This is set in the Witcher world, and it is. Um, going all the way back in time to the conjunction of the spheres, the creation of the witches, what actually happened in that really important moment there in the history of the continent. It's always been a little bit vague when you read the books. Uh, they've not really covered it on the TV show. The video games do kind of mention it, but it's still a little bit vague. So this is the first chance we get to really explore what was going on. And I'm I'm excited to see what they do with this. So as they finish filming it now, it is a mini series. I think it's going to be six episodes. Expect to see that maybe sometime in the summer is, is what we're looking at there. So the summer's looking like it's going to be quite a, an exciting time all round. I think it, that's probably when we're going to be getting House of the Dragon. Um, they haven't confirmed that yet. September the 2nd is when we're going to get the Lord of the Rings TV show, and obviously this for The Witcher as well. So a lot of things going on there. Um, quickly uh, had a couple of uh, 
Super Chats, thank you very much. Roman Lakovets saying, uh, as yet another year without wins comes to an end. How disappointed are you on a scale from one to Dolorous Ed? Uh, yes, it's disappointing. The um, I, I imagine we will get uh, from George R. R. Martin at the end of the year. He seems now to have got into this habit of giving us yearly updates on how he's going. Um, he will give us an update. I'm I'm still feeling reasonably upbeat that we're not too far off now. Just trying to read between the lines of what he's been saying, um, how he's been acting. I don't think we're that far off. Do not forget that the editorial process for this is going to be mammoth because this is going to be a huge book. And there will, even when it's completed, there's going to be quite a lot of work that needs to be done to this. So how disappointed am I? Very, because like everybody, I was not expecting, but hoping this might be the year after 2020 was the year that he made the most progress he's ever made with this book. Um, I, I think I think we're not far off, but yeah, I was hoping for this Christmas, but obviously not. Um, and we've got uh, Kelly Johnson saying uh, or asking, will Wheel of Time... Uh, flame out quickly or last a few um in terms of series and uh, numbers of seasons as i say two are guaranteed they're filming the second one already my i mean i think it's too early to make predictions on how long it's going to last let's see how the first season uh, pans out i i think it started strong um for me as as a as a good fantasy franchise uh, whether it the, the issue is not actually as far as how long will it last? It's not actually how well does it adapt to books or even how pretty does it look or anything like that. It's whether it captures the imagination of the wider TV going, TV watching audience. That's that's the key thing. The fan base for The Wheel of Time is there and is strong and is good and they love what it is, but it is not big enough on its own to be carrying this beyond a couple of seasons. Other people have to be drawn into this. So that's the kind of thing we'll only find with time. Um, uh, the Real YT saying, I'll watch The Wheel of Time when season one ends to binge watch it. Yeah, I think quite a few people may well be doing that. Um, Carl Karsnark saying, I'm tending towards Dolores Ed status more and more as of late. I do hope for, that uh, no news is good news. I think no news is no news is in terms of the winds of winter. And, and I think that we shouldn't read into silence too much uh, one way or the other. Uh, Mara Lee. Oh, hi there, Mara. Uh, uh, happy Thanksgiving to you, Mara. Uh, to all who are in celebration in the USA, I wish everyone a very happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Robert, for all that you do. You are a blessing indeed. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mara. Mara. I hugely appreciate your support. I know lots of other people in the community. Uh, also, you you help out in many ways, with, and um, uh, you are the MVP. So thank you. I am very grateful for, uh, for you and your support and friendship. Um, okay, I think that's, that's me caught up on the chat. Um, what I will do... Um, Oh, there was one other thing. Did I mention that something I discovered again? I keep on forgetting and then discovering again. They've made a Dungeons and Dragons movie. I don't know whether you knew this. Uh, they have finished filming it. They finished filming it earlier this year. This is a proper high budget um, Dungeons and Dragons movie. It's got Chris Pine um, among others. I think Hugh Grant is in it uh, uh, actually as the, the the villain. It's got a big budget. It could be good. Dungeons and Dragons adaptations, the history is a little bit patchy, it has to be said, uh, but I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, so 2023, I think I heard for that, um, uh, but uh, who knows? That's another thing which just came across my radar. Um, and finally, in terms of parish announcements, before we get on into the War of the Five Kings, uh, I am now, I think I've sort of mentioned this a couple of times but i am now live streaming these at the same time on youtube and also on twitch um i'm paying attention to the youtube comments rather than anything that happens on twitch uh, and i'm not expecting a huge audience there that's much more of a sort of a gaming platform but i thought if i dual stream 
If you find it easier to watch on Twitch, then please do go over there um, and watch uh, through that instead. Uh, I just thought it might be an easier way for people, for some people to watch this. So if you're, if you're watching this and you'd rather watch it live on Twitch, then please do go and check that out. Um, Cloaked One, uh, hi there. Uh, fantastic to see you saying, been in a sentimental mood this morning, reading all the Thanksgiving well wishes from my North American friends. Just wanted to say that I'm personally thankful for all the hard work you do and for the IDG community. Uh, well, thank you. That that means a huge amount. I am, uh, so Thanksgiving, it's not a thing we obviously do in, in the UK, uh, but um, uh, just as a concept of spending a day and being thankful and trying to work out what am I thankful for I think is a wonderful idea uh, I am incredibly thankful for uh, you cloaked one on all that you do as well as the moderators in particular uh, here if you are watching this live please give the moderators a bit of love they they just do this out of the goodness of their heart wonderful people uh, so uh, thank you moderators I hugely appreciate what you do um not just here, just in the, the general chat, but when when we've got a TV show on uh, or when the spam bot decides to, to target the channel, they really come into their own. So thank you so much. And the community as a whole, I am hugely grateful. So thank you. Um, the War of the Five Kings, let's get into this. So this is... This is a mammoth war that we hear lots and lots about. Uh, morally, um, you asked a few questions uh, about who the five kings were, what the main battles were, things along those uh, uh, lines. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll wrap all of those questions up in giving an overview of the, uh, the war as a whole, and then I will get into some specific questions from the chat and also obviously from my patrons. So, how did it start? Quick sip of water just before I get going. How did it start? Well, the, the trigger for this, the thing which started events rolling, if you have to pick something, it's when Catelyn Stark captured Tyrion at the Inn at the Crossroads. That's the point at which um, Tywin Lannister had to respond. We know what Tywin Lannister is like. If somebody does something to a, mem to a Lannister, then he has to respond strongly, firmly, swiftly. So his response straight away was to start gathering an army together. Um, then Ned down in King's Landing, he gets thrown into the Black Cells. Rob has to respond. He starts gathering an army. And the moment he starts heading south with his army, Tywin has to, he, he has to, as a person, he has to be on the front foot. He's not just going to hang around and wait and see what happens. He launches an attack. And there are three um, different uh, armies is probably the, the, the wrong saying, way of saying it. There are two armies and one small group of doing guerrilla warfare. And actually what I will do, let's see whether I can get the uh, the technology working. Um, we have got here a map of the central chunk of the, the Seven Kingdoms. Now this, uh, this is a screenshot I should probably say from uh, quartermaster.info, which is a fantastic website. I've no idea who runs it, but whoever they are, I doff my cap to them uh, because it's fantastic interactive map of Westeros and Essos. Um, I've circled a few different places there just to help you get a little bit of your bearings. Right down in the bottom right-hand corner there, that's Storm's End. That's where Renly starts. If you move up to the island there on the east, then you will see that's Dragonstone. That's where Stannis starts. King's Landing there, sort of, uh, I'm sure you know where King's Landing is. That's where the um, Joffrey starts. At the top of the lake in the middle, that's the God's Eye Lake. That's Harren Hall, which is I've circled there. That's really important going through this uh, war. It changes hands so many times. But that that area, as as with all of the history of Westeros, around the God's Eye Lake, uh, the Isle of Faces, Harren Hall, the Inn at the Crossroads, the Ruby Ford, they're all within just a few miles of each other there. That's the crossroads at the centre of Westeros. 
If you go sort of left and up a bit from there, you'll find River Run. Uh, and then if you go all the way over to the left, to the west, the, the, the thing I circled there is Castle Rock. So that's to help you get your bearings. The Lannisters started, obviously, Castle Rock over in the far west. Two forces headed out. Tywin's main force headed sort of eastwards, straight into the middle of the... Uh, the Riverlands, and Jamie's headed up towards River Run. He won a couple of battles, and then he started besieging River River Run. The Tywin's main force heads into the centre, um, and he sets up camp on the King's Road at the Inn at the Crossroads, right by Harrenhal. The reason for this is that coming down south, down the King's Road, all the way from the north, is Rob Stark's army, and he wants to block them. He wants to stop them from getting to King's Landing. So we've got one force there over outside River Run, another force there at the Inn at the Crossroads blocking the, uh, the King's Road. The third force that I was talking about, this is Gregor Clegane, who has a small group of um, they're, they're under no banner. They are Lannister forces. Everyone knows they're Lannister forces, but they're pretending just to be sort of Guerrilla brigands. These are the people who are going through their raising land, attacking farmsteads in the Riverlands. They've got two objectives, one of which is to try and draw the Tully forces out so that there are a few of them defending places like River Run. Secondly, they are trying to take on, they were hoping that Ned himself would come out leading a force to try and take on Gregor again. As it happens, this was Beric Dondarrion. The Battle of the Mummers Ford is where Beric gets killed. We know what happened after that. Uh, but that third force is roving all the way around the Riverlands, causing huge amounts of damage and devastation. So that's the, the starting point. Rob is faced with this as he heads down south. What does he do? Everybody's expecting him just to head straight down south, down the King's Road, and face the main bulk of Tywin's army. But he splits his force. Uh, the majority do exactly that. He leaves control to Roose Bolton. They head down south to uh, face off against Tywin's um, army, uh, and Tywin wins that. But he thought he was going to be facing Rob Stark. He wasn't. He was, um, in the end, he was facing uh, Roose Bolton. Roose, when he realizes he's beaten, he does an orderly retreat. It's not a huge victory. Most of the forces remain intact. And he just sort of heads back up north again a bit, retreats, gather, regathers himself. But while this is happening, Rob and some hand picked, uh, mostly cavalry, head off down to River Run. So they're heading to River Run. They take Jamie by surprise. They capture Jamie. Then they uh, relieve the siege of River Run. They destroy a lot of the Lannister armies there. Some manage to escape back into the Westlands, but most are destroyed or captured. So the first round of this war actually is probably a clear victory for the Starks. They've caught the Lannisters um, unawares, and with Rob now being on the west of the Green Fork River, this means that he's cut off Tywin's uh, supply lines from the Westerlands, and He's blocking him to the north. Tywin sort of has to stay where he is to prevent Roos Bolton from coming down south. But at the same time, Rob is cutting off his supply lines from uh, the west, so he's in a quite an awkward situation. While that's happening, we get to the second theatre uh, opening up, which is what is happening with the Baratheons. There are two uh, armies here. We get Stannis, who has got quite a small army, based on Dragonstone, and Renly, who has a massive army. Uh, he has his Stormlands army, and he gets an alliance with House Tyrell. Now, this is, this is really important, because House Tyrell and the Reach have the largest army uh, in all of the Seven Kingdoms. So if you add up all of the forces available, it's probably about 100,000, which compares to Rob seems to have had somewhere around maybe maximum 20,000. The two Lannister forces, maybe 30,000. They are the Renly and the Tyrells together, easily the biggest army. And 
the Lannisters are concerned about this. This then places, at this moment in time, the Lannisters are actually in quite a, an awkward position because Tywin is stuck in the middle. He dare not move from where he is because the Roose Bolton might come down. But at the same time, he wants to stop Rob, who's cutting off his supply lines and could attack his homeland, the Westerlands. And then what about the the Baratheons? They could attack King's Landing. So he's quite at a disadvantage at this point. But then we get the confrontation between Renly and Stannis. And as we know, what happens is that Renly dies. Renly is killed by the Shadow Baby. What happens then? The fallout is actually relatively straightforward. The people who the 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 Stormlanders, the Baratheon bannermen who were supporting Renly, most of them just switch and go over to Stannis. But the Tyrells, everyone knows this is Stannis. This was Stannis who killed Renly. They're not going to stick by this because by Stannis because this was black magic and this was the person who was married to Marjorie Tyrell. So they leave the party and they head back off sort of towards central Westeros. What are they going to do? This is the big unknown at this point. Switching back up to Rob, Rob is now faced with a problem. He has now just been proclaimed king himself, king of the north, and also king of the Riverlands, a much overlooked fact. The Riverlanders declare him their king too. So he's he's one king. We've got four kings going on now, though one Renly has already died. Um, what's he going to do? Well, his general plan is that he wants Stannis or to now take King's Landing, and then he thinks he can cut a deal with Stannis. Um, he wants the Lannisters are the big problem for him, obviously, so he wants to get rid of them. He also, he's always very aware of what other people think of him, Rob. He, as, as, a, as a person, he's always just um, wondering, and Cat sort of builds on this with him as well, but he's always wondering, what, how, am, how are my generals, how are my bannermen going to view me? How are other people going to view me? Am I, I'm only, he's only 15, 16 by this point, and it's like, how are people actually going to view me as their king? What would a king do? Um, so he, eventually decides he can't just sit where he is. He has to head off to do something. And his decision is to go into the Westlands. And he takes his force off into the Westlands. He hasn't got a big enough army to be taking on Castle Rock itself or Lannisport, but he starts attacking all of the smaller um, places that he can find, one after another. He wins battle after battle. He, he destroys Lannister crops. He takes Lannister gold. Uh, he is causing a real, real nuisance. And eventually, Tywin has to do something. He can't let Rob carry on doing this. And possibly against his better judgment, he heads off to try and take on, take on Rob, abandons his position. At which point we get one of the most crucial moments, because Rob leaves Riveron in command of Edmure Tully. Edmure is, well, we all know what Edmure is like, but uh, when he sees uh, Tywin and his army coming toward trying to cross the river, he makes a decision which in and of itself, is probably actually a relatively sensible decision. He says, I, I don't want to let Tywin cross the, the river. I'm not going to let him. In fact, if I stop him crossing the river, and if Roos Bolton comes around to the other side of the army, then we can trap him. So he, he prevents Tywin Lannister from crossing the river, getting back into the Riverland, into the Westerlands. And this is, there are 12 separate battles here, apparently. 12 times Tywin tried to cross the river, 12 times um, Edmure's forces. It's not just Edmure, the Blackfish is there as well, doing a lot of the heavy lifting, as always. But he does well. He stops him coming across. And that delay is crucial, because that's the point at which Tywin gets the message that about what happened with Renly and Stannis, and that the Tyrells are now at a loss as to what to do. Who are they going to ally with? 
he turns around and heads back and becomes allies with the Tyrells. And he comes up with this plan. He says, right, let's just head straight down. Stannis is now heading for King's Landing. Stannis wants to attack King's Landing. We'll head down. We'll cut them off. And um, uh, hopefully we can then uh, get rid of the Baratheons first and then turn back around and get rid of the Starks. So he does that. Stannis attacks King's Landing. This is the Battle of the Blackwater. We know the Battle of the Blackwater was fantastic on screen. And the the truth when you dig into it is that, yes, Tywin with the chain across uh, the, the Blackwater, all of the wildfire uh, that's there, this, this was very effective, but it wasn't going to win the battle. It, Stannis was on the verge of winning. Tyrion, when he did that little sortie out, that was actually, yes, it was very brave, but it was actually, it, it didn't, didn't work. It would, it nearly, it sort of pushed back a little bit, but it didn't, didn't stop Stannis from getting to the point where he was about to take King's Landing. What won the Battle of the Blackwater was when the Tywin and the uh, Tyrells arrived and attacked Stannis' army from behind. They also had this wonderful plan. Gollum Gull Tyrell was wearing Renly's armour. Renly was well known for the... He had a very specific type of armour, which meant that when he rode into battle, the people who had previously supported Renly and now were supporting Stannis, they, like, did a double take. Wait, who... Is that... Is that Renly? Is that is that Renly's ghost? What's what's going on? And that confusion had aided the uh, the victory. And Stannis's forces were pretty much destroyed. He just managed to limp back to Dragonstone, and uh, with a small amount of force. And that, largely in terms of the War of the Five Kings, was that for Stannis. He heads up north, and yes, we've got all of the. Uh, the the battles and adventures that happen up north, but that did not impact on the War of the Five Kings. So at this point, suddenly the Lannisters are in control. The the Lannisters and the Tyrells across the south now. Once you add in the fact that Tyrion astonishingly managed to get the Dornish to agree to a deal by uh, agreeing for Marcella to be to get engaged to Tristane Martel that meant that they had Dawn locked in they had the Crownlands they had the Westlands they had the Reach and quite a lot of the Stormlands apart from the two main castles of Dragonstone and um Storm's End so they were well set they were the clear winners of this early uh, part of the war. Things were going to take another twist in just a moment, but let me just very quickly uh, have a quick look in the chat. I think I had um, another question. Um, Kelly Johnson saying, um, the Baratheon's refusal to make peace was their doom. Um, well, yes, but also they had a good chance to win. They had the biggest army at one point and they had a good chance to win. Um, uh, Reflective Lambling saying, don't lie to them. You know you pay us an exclusive Dan photos. Um, yeah, I would love to. <laughs> Happy to. Um, Dan photos tend to appear on Instagram. If you're interested, if you uh, if you want more pictures of Dan, go, that's Dan, my dog, uh, go uh, and check out my Instagram. Just look, I think I'm in the Eek official over there. Um, right. Um, Brandon Brown saying, Oh, I'm li liking the upgrades to the channel lately. Yeah. So this is, this has been my, what I've been trying to do over the course of the last uh, few weeks, months, uh, is just a little bit of upgrades to the, particularly the, own, obviously the green screen, uh, improved audio and visual stuff. So, um, I've got more things planned for the new year, but hopefully uh, you're seeing the benefit of this now. Okay, let's dip back into what happened next. So we have um, the situation here where we've had four kings, but we have a fifth king to uh, 
to think about. At which point, let me see whether I can get the technology to uh, work again. Um, and if I can do this. Yeah, let's go that one. Uh, here we have a map of the north. Because the the fifth king to get engaged in this war was Balon Greyjoy of the Iron Islands. Now, the Iron Islanders like the like the North, like Dawn, never really felt of themselves as being a key part of the Seven Kingdoms. That wasn't their identity. They they felt that they were different, they special, they had their own heritage history. And they tried, literally just a few years before there'd been the Greyjoy Rebellion, Balon Greyjoy had tried to break free, to declare himself king. So when he sees the entire continent of Westeros erupting into flame, he sees his chance again. And he declares himself king, and he decides to launch attacks down along the coast of the north. So from the Iron Islands, the Iron Islands are off the bottom of this map on the left, off the west coast of Westeros. And he sends three different raiding parties, effectively. The first, you will see the, the circle sort of in the bottom middle, that there is Moat Kaelin. Moat Kaelin is hugely strategically important for the north. This is the, the entrance to the north. If you hold Moat Kaelin, you can hold the north from attack by land. That's the theory, at least. Victarion came in and took Moat Kaelin. He did this in a clever way. He took some boats with very is it narrow draft. I'm not really a sailor, but they, they could go in very shallow water. He took them through um, uh, the, the swampy land there in the neck, and brought them around the other side of Moat Kaelin so he could attack it, not from the south where it's best defended. Caught them by surprise, he took Moat Kaelin. Victory number one for the, the Iron Islanders. Asha, Yara, Greyjoy, she went all the way to the north. At the top there, you will see that is Greenwood Mott, where I've circled in red there. Uh, that's just south of uh, Bear Island, incidentally, just off the top of the map is Bear Island. And she took that. That's the home of House Glover. So she captured Greenwood Mott. The third um, raiding party was led by Theon. Now, Theon was not there to be invading anywhere. His father just sent him to raid up and down. This is the Stony Shore, which is the, the big circle on the left there. And he basically said, just sort of raid up and down a little bit, uh, keep them distracted. Um, and let the other people do the real work. And Theon started doing this, uh, and, but we know Theon, he felt he had to prove himself. And so in having to prove himself, he thought, what can I do? How can I show that I can do what these other people can do, Victorian and Asher, who are, let's face it, very, very good, very competent at what they do. He wanted to show that he could not just do the same as them, but better than them. What is the biggest prize in the North? Winterfell. He knew Winterfell, and he crucially knew the people there who were defending it. Now, what had happened with uh, the defence of Winterfell was that most of the troops had headed south. We, we see this in the Bran chapters in Book 1 in A Game of Thrones. Uh, it's sort of hinted at, foreshadowed even, how Bran sees all of the soldiers heading south, and Who's left? Well, just this kind of uh, group of younger people who are probably not quite old enough to go to war. Some uh, veterans who are probably too old to go to war. Not many prime fighters. Roderick Cassell returns and starts drilling them, and he gets a reasonable force over time. There's a couple of thousand soldiers there uh, in the end in Winterfell. But Theon has a cunning plan, and it's actually not a bad plan. Theon gets a lot of bad rep. It's generally deserved, but this is not too bad a plan, actually. He sends a 
bulk of his force into, if you go from the large circle on the left, which is the Stony Shore, in to the next circle you see there, that is a place called Torren Square. He sends the bulk of his force in there to attack and invade Torren Square. Not because he wants to win that, that's a pretty insignificant place, but because he knows that Roderick Cassell will bring his forces out from Winterfell and go and try and defend it. And that's exactly what happened. Roderick Cassell took his 2,000 soldiers out. Theon, meanwhile, sneaks his way through uh, into Winterfell and captures Winterfell, as we know. He's not got the force to defend it. This is an incredibly vain thing to do. Asher comes to him and says, look, you've got to, okay, well done, you did this, but this is overextending. <laughs> this, the, uh, the Iron Islanders aren't into land conquest. We just want to take the places, the strategically important places along the coast, um, show, extend our power. That's it. Taking Winterfell was never part of the plan. But he says no. And at this point, Victorian and Asher both actually, round about this time, they both head back to the Iron Islands because what's happening in the background here is Balon Greyjoy himself dies almost certainly killed by Euron, who has suddenly reappeared. There's a king's moot. Asher heads back. Victarion heads back. They still, they, they leave some small forces defending those two places, but that's it. Theon is there in Winterfell, and suddenly he's got Roderick Cassells coming back up with his 2,000 men and is about to besiege Winterfell. And what does... Theon do? Well, he kind of digs his heels in. Another force of Boltons comes up. The Boltons are Stark allies, so Roderick Cassell welcomes them in, but they are led by Ramsay, and we'll come on to the, the Bolton betrayal in just one moment. This is part of it. They attack the Starks, catch them by surprise, then they attack Winterfell, burn it, and that is how Ramsay and the Boltons gained Winterfell. What does this mean? Well, in the longer run, the, the forces at Deepwood Mott and the, the Ironborn forces at Deepwood Mott and Moat Kaelin are both also destroyed. So the Iron Islanders, yes, they had their moment in the sun. They captured some ground, but they just went back to the Iron Islanders and there was no long-term gain for them. But the big impact is, of course, on House Stark. House Stark has lost Winterfell. It's lost Moat Kaelin. So Rob, back down in the Riverlands, suddenly is completely cut off. His Winterfell has gone. It's, he's been told that Bran and Rickon are both dead. He knows Arya is missing. Sansa has now been married to the um the to Tyrion, married into the Lannisters. She's she's not uh in any way um going to be helpful for him. So so what does he do? This is the point when he's at his low ebb. That is when he meets Jane Westerling. Uh, she, he gets injured in a battle. She tends him uh, they sleep together the next morning. Honorable, honorable Rob decides I have to marry her. And this is obviously breaking the marriage pact that he had with uh, the phrase, with Walder Frey. So, Rob then, from a position that was relatively strong, has suddenly turned into one that is incredibly. Um, let's go, let's see whether I can get the technology to work again and go back to um, the uh, the other picture, uh, which I think is this one. Excellent. So uh, here we are back again with the main section in the middle of the Riverlands. Rob is uh, is off in the Westerlands. What does he do? Well, well of his plans now to be taking 
taking on the Lannisters, given the Lannisters are now in huge control of the South, as we said earlier, they're in tatters. He's now um, hugely offended one of his biggest allies, Walder Frey, and Winterfell has gone. He Obviously, he has to head back up north. Tail between his legs, he heads back up north. And he agrees this deal with Walder Frey that um, he, although obviously he can no longer marry Walder Frey's daughter, Edmure Tully is going to marry one of Walder Frey's daughters. So they come up with this plan. Um, they both head up to um, the, the twins, to House Frey, and that's when the Red Wedding happens. The Boltons have betrayed them. So... That as much as uh, as much as uh, anyone's really concerned is the War of the Five Kings. How it it's it sort of peters out rather than officially ends at any point. The battles obviously carry on. Uh, the Iron Islanders, Euron comes in. He then starts raiding off down to the south. Stannis, as we've already said, he heads up to the north. Um, but as far as everyone's concerned, Renly's gone. Starks are completely destroyed, as far as everybody's aware, and the Lannisters and the Tyrells are in control of the the vast majority of central and southern Westeros. Jaime sort of ends the the this by mopping up the parts of the Riverlands. We, we see this. He goes from sort of castle to castle, claiming them for the Lannisters, getting wherever there were some uh, some bits of resistance he just washes through them raven tree hall he goes to river run they fall one after another to the lannisters so at the end of the war of the five kings it's not really a matter of uh who won i've got a question about who won uh the the lannisters as a family were the people who won the war of the five kings joffrey of course who was one of those five kings, died. So he did not, as a king, he did not. But House Lannister, the whole that period, had won. It was a huge cost. Tywin is dead. Joffrey is dead. Uh, huge amounts of their army has been destroyed. But they were pretty much the victors. Um. Okay, so let's. Uh, I'll. I think I'll keep that one up actually. Um, and let's dip back into the chat. I think I had a couple more questions. Mm -mm. Yeah, I had one from. Uh, Chris C. Oh, it's not a question. Just saying, appreciate you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chris C. Thank you uh, uh, for the super chat. I hugely appreciate that. And uh, Pixie Penrose, uh, thank you for the uh, super sticker. I'm not 100% sure what that's a picture of. Is that a lemon waving at me? I don't know. Uh, anyway, but thank you. I do really appreciate that. Um, Lady Nymeria is saying, next stage is to annotate the maps live. That's well, yes, absolutely. I'm I'm loving the fact that I can get the maps up. That I, I personally I love maps. I, uh, uh, I I think they really help to understand how uh, how the sort of the geopolitics of everything uh, works. But um, uh, yeah, if I can, maybe I'll try and figure out how to do that. Sort of uh, uh, draw on them as I go. Um, uh, so let's go into some questions. I, I always try and frame these around questions from my patrons. I'll, I'll do this now because while I remember, patrons, thank you. I cannot do what I do without your support. I hugely appreciate you uh, for, for all of your support. And one of the ways I'd like to say thank you back is by giving priority questions to my patrons. So um, give advance warning to my patrons uh, what the subject is going to be for the live stream and uh, allow them to send me questions over there that they want answering. So let's do that. Sebastian Schumala saying, hello, Robert. Great, great topic as always. Great. Uh, what was Rob's plan to capture the Westerlands in the books? It seems a little different from what happened in the show. 
The main points seem to be the same, and if I remember correctly, Rob didn't have enough men to capture either Lannisport or Casterly Rock. Why didn't he go back to the north, instead focusing on capturing small castles and raiding? Well, yes, so I think the key point here is he was never about capturing the Westerlands. That was not his aim. He was, this was, to start with, this was a point of principle that his father, Ned, had been killed. And so it was uh, trying to avenge that. But his general plan, which I started teasing out in, in the, the big overview I gave a moment ago, was that he thought, if if I can start attacking the Westerlands, if I can start attacking the Tywin Lannister's homeland, at some point he's got to come and move from where he is at that strategically important position in the centre of Westeros. Tywin was camped at, at Harrenhal in the middle. He was stopping anyone coming from the north to attack uh, at King's Landing. And um, Rob thought, if I can just bring him out to the west, the Baratheons have got big enough armies that they can take out King's Landing. Rob made the strategic decision. He did not himself have to attack King's Landing. He could let whichever Baratheon it was. Renly, he sent uh, his mother down to Renly to try and come to some deal with, uh, with Renly. If Renly, was his initial thought, could attack King's Landing, then take out the Lannisters there, then... All he had to do was come to some agreement with, with Renly afterwards, which probably could have worked. He probably could have got some, some kind of agreement that he could head back up to the north. Maybe he could even get independence for the north. It, we don't know how that would have played out, but it looked promising. So that's the main point. He wasn't trying to invade. And by that point, he also wasn't even trying to attack King's Landing. Why didn't he go back north? Well, once Winterfell had fallen, he and the Lannisters had defeated the Baratheons, he did. He then had no other choice. But until that point, he was still holding out this idea that maybe he could cut some deal with the Baratheons, and then he could return north after that. Uh, Zakalok saying, good day to you, Robert. I was rereading the chapter where Arya is cupbearer to Roose Bolton in Harrenhal. It seems that a lot is happening and Arya is not understanding everything. After making her read a seemingly boring letter from Roose's fray wife, he asks her to burn it. It is apparently not the first time that he asks this of her and the letters are coming daily. Why immediately burn such a meaningless letter? Do you think that uh, those are actually cryptid letters from Lord Frey to Bolton and that the Frey Bolton treason is already en route? Just after Arya reads the letter, he means to send some Stark bannermen to Duskendale, which is a very poor strategic choice. Is he doing this on purpose to get rid of them? Has the letter triggered the whole treason? Well, this is this is one of, I have to say, I talked about this, I think, a couple of weeks ago in context of... Roos burning a book, but this is something else that he gets. Uh, he gets Arya to burn this letter. This chapter is one of my favourite chapters in the entirety of the Song of Ice and Fire because not only do we have when you read it first of all, it's from Arya's point of view. Not only do we have the things that Arya understands, and therefore we as a reader understand, but there are also things that she does not understand that we do, that we can see things happening that she can see happening and we understand the significance of them. But then there's also another level of, to that, which is a lot of things that we only understand on the next read-through, because what is happening in reality as well as um, thematically and symbolically is not going to play out until the Red Wedding. The, the seeds for the betrayal are very clearly there, but it's not 
apparent until you read back, having seen what happens much later in the plot. So that's why I love that. Um, and at a, a sort of a very high level, that where this is in the overall narrative is that Bruce Bolton has, he's taken Harren Hall. So once Tywin has abandoned Harren Hall, Bruce Bolton then comes down and takes it. And he's sort of sitting there and watching what's going on in the wider world around him. He's got this big force. It's, it's his forces, the Boltons, plus a load of Freys, plus some Stark loyalists from a variety of, of, of houses that are loyal to the Starks. And he's sitting there in Harren Hall and just hearing the news coming in. They hear the news about the Battle of the Blackwater. They hear that the, so the Lannisters are victorious in the South. They hear the news that Rob has um, married Jane Westerling, so broken the vow, uh, the, the agreement that he had with Walder Frey. The Frey troops there are up in arms about it. Roos is not saying much, but... He gets this letter from uh, from his wife. Uh, then he reads it, or actually he gets Kyburn to read it out loud, and it is a very boring letter. It's just, it's short, but it's very boring. It says, hello, dear, how are you? Everything's lovely up here. Um, uh, I hope everything's lovely down there. Well, I'm paraphrasing, obviously. I hope everything's lovely down there. Um, I, I really hope you can come back up to the twins soon so that um, I can, you know, we can try for a baby and then I will have a son who can succeed you. Something along those lines. Um, Kyburn reads it out. Roos says, I go burn that. After that, um, he does a couple of things. He sends some troops to Duskendale and he then rather symbolically goes hunting for wolves. And then uh, afterwards, we get what I was talking about last time. You get, we get this wonderful scene when he's burning an old book, very symbolic. Now, what what is all of this? Is this a coded message going on here? Well, the overall theme of that chapter and so many chapters George R. R. Martin writes are like short stories where you get sort of a beginning and end, a sort of an, an arc, a narrative arc. This is one of them. The burning of the book towards the end is the sort of the end. He's, this is him having made a decision. That I'm turning my back on the Starks, on this ancient um, alliance that we've had. There are obviously other symbolic things like the wolf hunt and the like. Is, is this the moment that he decides to switch sides? Yes, it is the moment that he decides to switch sides. But George R. R. Martin has been very clear that he, for a very long time, this is just sort of answering Q&As, for a very long time he was keeping his options open. He's obviously allied to the phrase. He was in some sort of communication with the Lannisters. He was obviously still, on the face of it, staying loyal to the Starks. So he was he was keeping himself there, weighing up his options until the moment it became apparent suddenly the Starks have lost Winterfell. Rob has reneged on his promise to Walder Frey. The Lannisters have won in the south. I have to switch sides. Is that letter the thing which triggered it? Probably not specifically. Could it have been a cipher? Well, quite possibly, but something as simple as if it was a very similar letter each time and maybe just a phrase included that says, you know, won't you come back up to very soon to the twins? Maybe he's waiting for that as a sign that, that the Lannisters have, have agreed something with the phrase and he now, now needs to head up in order to um, play his part in that. It's possible. That's never spelt out. It's never even really hinted at. It's possible, but during this period, during that chapter, is when he makes up his mind. Even without that letter, he would have made up his mind. The the outside news coming in, the Battle of the Blackwater, Rob breaking his uh, agreement with the phrase, that those things in and of themselves would have been enough, I suspect, to make him change his mind. 
to switch sides. So it may have been a cipher, but it's just it would be just one of many things. Uh, reflective rambling. Thank you so much. Picking up for uh, Miguel Lopez. Uh, I love it when people do this. Thank you. You do this a lot, reflective rambling, picking up questions for other people. Could Rob have asked Dawn for their help? After all, they also hated the Lannisters and their relationship with the Reach wasn't very good. Yeah, he could have done. Um, the thing is that they are, they don't really have a point of contact is the problem <laughs> between Dawn is at the very south of the continent uh, and the, the north is obviously at the very north of the continent. They didn't have a natural point of contact between the two. What Rob did when he was there at deciding what to do at River Run, he, he decided, yes, I want to now try and call in favours from people, try and draw people in. And he had one clear link across to the Iron Islands, so he sent Theon off there to try and persuade uh, his father to, to join in with Rob. That obviously didn't go too well. He sent his mother down uh, to meet Renly. Uh, she was very well politically well, well engaged, so she knew them. Uh, so she could head down there to try and negotiate something with Renly. He sent a message over to uh, the Eyrie to try and get the, the Tullys. His mother had already been there and that hadn't worked, so he thought he'd just try something slightly more direct. So he did try to get people on side but there was no obvious link across with dawn and they did Tyrion. this was something that Tyrion managed really quite effectively was this marriage alliance but this is before the battle of the blackwater he manages to get a marriage alliance with um with dawn so could he have if he'd been quick uh he, if he could find somebody with some way in, possibly. The Dornish, yes, the Martells do hate the Lannisters, and they were just playing some clever game to try and get into King's Landing and then wreak re their revenge, but, um, or wreak their revenge, but the, um, it was it was never the easiest uh, set of um, allies for them. Um Uh, Shetland Apache saying, seems like Rob and Stannis would have gotten on pretty well if he would bend the knee. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think a deal would have been possible. And I think Rob knew that a deal was possible, that clearly his father and Stannis had a um, a respect for one another, if, if not a friendship. Um, and I think that they probably would have managed to, uh, to do something there. Um, question from uh, Jake G., saying, hi, Robert, finally in a position to resub on Patreon after the craziness of the pandemic. It's good to be back. It's fantastic to have you back. Uh, this war really sets up so much of the story. There's the big events such as the Red Wedding, but the direct, but the indirect consequences of the war were also huge. The birth of the Sparrows and the High Sparrows own war on the nobility all stems from the devastation this war brought to Westeros. You really do have to admire George R. R. Martin's ability to weave it all together. In what ways do you think the outcome of the Sparrow storyline in the books will differ to the show? Uh, apologies for the slightly off-topic question. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not as off-topic as you say. The, the link is clearly there. The, the people uh, or the war created a huge amount of dispossessed people. It created a huge amount of hurting people. And that drove a lot of people back to the, the the fundamentals of the faith. And this was something when you read it in Fire and Blood that that happened again and again is that people went back to the faith and not just in the the very um, kind of establishment faith that there was there with with the High Septon, but the basic hardcore faith of the Seven, which often became quite militant. So it is as a direct result of that and that the the Sparrow movement, such as it is, did gain traction. And it's Cersei trying to uh, 
do her own political machinations in the wake of the war that gives the sparrows their power later on as for how their story ends will it be as the same as in the books well i think on one level yes and that level is that cersei is going to try to destroy them and the tyrells this this is very clearly set up uh, in in the last book that she just she wants to get rid of them whether it's exactly the same with the blowing up of the great sept i personally suspect it probably will be um but is exactly the same or not she's going to do something big and dramatic to try and get rid of both the tyrells and the sparrows the sparrows are congregating around the great sept so um is that the end now on the show yes it was that was I mean, we didn't really hear from them again that, that after they'd been destroyed that was it cersei's got rid of the problem and uh well done her that's not how it will be in the books because this if she destroys the great sept that's an attack on the faith she is then not just a, a monarch in all but name regent who people dislike she's actually someone who is heretically trying to destroy the holiest site or one of the two holiest sites probably in in the faith of the seven now the rest of the country has adherents of the faith of the seven when they hear what's going on there she she is going to be um persona non grata across the country as far as adherents of the faith of the seven are concerned so this is going to play out in a lot more ways this isn't going to just end the problem if anything this is going to exacerbate the problem it's going to create more people who are fervently um in favor of the faith and against her actions the other big hub for the faith of the seven of course is old town now are they going to suddenly do something at the Starry Sept over there? It's possible, but at the same time, that's where Euron's about to attack, and maybe he'll destroy it there. But I think the overall summary is: I think that they will, their base will be destroyed in the same way, but the base of people is not going to be destroyed that easily. And if anything, they're going to be incited to even more violence as a result of it. Um, uh, Britt Logan, thank you so much uh, for the uh, super sticker. Thank you. I hugely appreciate that. Um, question um, from Shetland Apache saying, where was Magister Illyrio during the War of the Five Kings? Seems he stopped plotting as Westeros um, is most vulnerable. D well, back in Pentos is the short answer. That's where he lives, and he is there. He popped across to have a chat with Varys right in book one, but then he goes back to Pentos, and that's when he is setting up his plans for Fagon. So he's at the heart of the Fagon thing. Varys is dealing with what's happening in Westeros. Illyrio is dealing with what's happening in Essos, and so when Tyrion escapes Varys helps Tyrion escape it's to Illyrio's so that is where he's been there is absolutely no reason whatever for him to be in Westeros for him to really he he should keep aware of what's going on with the four, War of the Five Kings but, but their original plan didn't happen the original plan was that uh, this was going to be Viserys and the Dothraki horde coming in and attacking. That didn't happen. So they then had to change gear and then bring um, Fagon in um, at a slightly later date. So that was the um, change of plan. So Illyrio was over there and not engaging directly with what was happening in Westeros. Uh, Cole Carsnock saying, Littlefinger was kind of right about the Starks not being the sharpest knives in the drawer. Cat, Ned and Rob all voluntarily messed up and hurt their overall cause, however well intended they may have been. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's quite hard. I mean, the so did Ned mess up? I mean, I, it's not. It's hard to say that he did. He he was doing what he thought was right, and so yeah, he wasn't he wasn't in his element there in King's Landing. Cat is clever. I, this is something I I mentioned when I. St- started my reread of game of thrones which i've nearly finished incidentally um it's been a very slow re- reread or re-listen because i've been going chapter by chapter and sort of analyzing it if you, if you want to hear my thoughts go over onto twitter i try and get through one or two chapters a week um just sort of breaking down a few bullet points for each chapter but and on twitter just hunt for in the geek you will find me cat comes across i hadn't picked up on it in earlier reads cat comes across as one of the most intelligent characters there is she uh, you you find several times that she um uh, she's there in her pov chapters with ned and the equivalent of uh, cat uh, thinking to herself okay i'll just pause for a moment and just wait ned will catch on in a moment um that's what um she's she's always one step ahead of him politically thinking tr- working through it through issues she's also somebody who she's she understands immediately about what has been happening with the lannisters yes little finger sort of pushes her along with Tyrion. that's a completely wrong, wrong and she's wrong to trust him but then when you get her capturing Tyrion. And heading off to the Eyrie, Tyrion himself thinks she's outsmarted me because she set a trail to be heading off in a direction that she didn't end up going in. And he, who is set up, Tyrion, who is set up to be always the cleverest person in the room, acknowledges that he's been outsmarted by Cat. So Cat comes across as being intelligent. Rob comes across as more like his father's son or wanting to be his father's son the marrying jane westling thing yes it wasn't politically sensible uh in fact it was pretty politically disastrous but he he wanted to do the right thing rather than what was politically the right thing morally the right thing the way he saw it was he put her um, her honor before his own is that he slept with her therefore didn't want to leave her dishonored he should marry her and that would leave him dishonored but this is actually quite a a ned stark kind of thing to do so it's not so much from littlefinger's perspective yes they're not the sharpest tools in the box but um it's more about what do they think is important um uh, reflective rambling saying uh Yes, spot on. Even if I think the little finger got a bit ahead of himself, he did. Little finger does get a bit of him ahead of himself. It has to be said. Um, so the, um, the the thing with little finger is when he talks about chaos is a ladder. It's it. We sometimes see it as oh, this means he's some sort of strategic genius. He's this isn't at all what he's saying. He's just saying very arrogantly. When it's all very complicated, I'm going to back myself to make the make the most of it compared to absolutely everyone else. That's what he's saying. He said, "I can I can work in the chaos better than anyone else can." That's just just arrogance. And as we will see going through this plot, he has left lots of loose ends lying around all over the place, and he seems very pleased with himself. But the amount of times you get uh, Tyrion knows that Littlefinger lied about the the dagger um Sansa knows about uh what happened obviously she's a witness to him murdering Lysa um the hound uh is there witnessing to what happened with him uh, the betrayal down in King's Landing there are so many of these loose ends just lying around that they will come back to haunt him, and that's how his he will reach his downfall. 
I am sure in the books is that all of these loose ends, he thinks he's so clever. He thinks he can just sort of keep on running ahead of all of this, but he can't, they are going to catch up to him. And uh, yes, he is good and clever, but not that clever. Um, he leaves way too many loose ends. Um, uh, King Carl saying, hey man, just wanted to, uh, you to know this is the first time I've caught you live. Massive fan about Rewind and Watch from the beginning, about to Rewind and Watch from the beginning. Love you, dude. Well, thank you very much. And very uh, you're very welcome. Uh, watching live is a very different experience from uh, what uh, watching a bit later. Please do get involved in the chat. There are some wonderful people there in the chat. Um, question from... Sebastian uh, Jumala saying, what will be Fagon's plan to deal with the aftermath of all the Westerosi wars, the War of the Five Kings included? The situation is pretty dramatic and food supplies are dwindling. Along with the grayscale epidemic and Daenerys' invasion, I think one of the great challenges he's going to face will be hunger, considering that winter is fast approaching. Do you think that the small folk will turn on him? simply because they will be starving. How will he get the, some, the money or supplies? Do you think that Dawn, being one of the regions mostly unaffected by war, will help him? He may be a great prospect for king, but in the end, if people don't have bread, they don't really care about who sits on the throne. Well, this is a, a really, uh, really good point. Um, and I think that the, the lack of bread, uh, the lack of food is going to play a big part in the winds of winter, particularly in King's Landing. We do see the first hints of it. If, if you read, if you want a lot of the morsels of what's going to be happening, the beginning of the plot trails of what's going to be happening in that theatre around King's Landing in the winds of winter, go to the epilogue, the, the Kevin Lannister epilogue that we have. There are so many just trails off of that. Um, one of them is the fact that supplies are being blocked coming into King's Landing. Just an offhand thing. The small council are discussing it. Kevin's got some plans for how to deal with this. Cersei clearly does not have plans, but Kevin gets killed. Cersei is going to be left with a problem because she's going to be the leading Lannister there. And Queen Regent... What is she going to do? Well, the people will be starving. And then she's going to do this. She's going to blow up the Great Sept or something along those lines. Lots of people are going to die. They are going to start hating her. She is going to be the, the equivalent of Queen Renus uh, with her six months rule in King's Landing, where people, by the end of it, they absolutely absolutely loathe and despise her because she's already talking about raising taxes. She's already um, not coming to grips with the, the lack of food. Uh, she's going to be killing lots of people. She is going to be hugely, hugely unpopular. So I think that is where it's going to play out. When Fagon comes in, he is going to be popular. We, we're pretty sure he's going to be popular because one of Danny's visions in the House of the Undying, which generally are pretty accurate, is of the Mama's Dragon being held aloft amidst cheering crowds. Now, people often focus on the Mama's Dragon element of it, but the fact of it is among cheering crowds. So he's going to be popular. Why is he going to be popular? Yes, because he's young and good looking and won a war and feels like a proper old Targaryen and has all of the accoutrements of power, all of those good things. And he probably is going to be wise and well-read and all the rest of it. But the crucial point is the food. How How is that, that going to come in? House Tyrell are critical to this because House Tyrell, obviously the, the Lord's Paramount of the Reach, the Reach is the, the garden of Westeros. This is where the most produce comes from. And thus far, the Reach has been largely unaffected by this war. That's going to change with Euron. Um, but thus far, largely unaffected. They've just had another harvest. Things are 
Okay. Who will tut the Tyrells support? Well, look, the moment, obviously, they're in alliance with the Lannisters. But if Cersei does go through with killing Marjorie, as she surely will, then they will change sides very quickly. Who are they going to side with? Probably the person who looks like they're best placed to take the crown, which will be Fagon at that point. So if they ally themselves there, it will be them who, along the uh, the road, the Rose Road, I think it's called, from um, the High Garden, they can be bringing in food uh, that way. So that is going to be how the food is, is brought in and probably part of how Fagon is going to be becoming so popular. Because if he can break the blockade, if he can bring food in, if he can feed people, they will love him as they ought. Um, Carl Kosnark, uh picking up a missed super chat. Thank you so much. I, I do sometimes, I try not to, but I do thank you very much, Carl, for picking up on that. This is from Eric um, saying, and thank you, Eric, saying, Balon told Theon and Asher uh, he wants to capture the whole north, but that Winterfell might hold a year, but that later seemed to change to only take the coast. Yeah, so... Balon had big ambitions, but at the same time, he was very clear on his directions to uh, to the people he sent out. Uh, yes, he he thought obviously we're amazing; we can take whatever we want to. But the Victarion was to take Moat Kalen, Asher was to take Deepwood Mott, and then Theon was to be harrying the coast. That. That was it. That was the plan. In terms of taking um, Winterfell, this this is not. This was never going to be a long term plan. This was never get, going to be. Even if Balon was was on board with it, which he wasn't really. Um, this was Theon just going rogue and trying to take it. But um, even if he was on board with it. He couldn't. He couldn't keep it. it that, that's a long way from the coast. The Iron Islanders were be, are best on the coast, so um, it's not. It's not part of their plan. It. It has to be said. Out of out of the five kings, the person uh, whose plan is less obvious, less clear, is Balon, because he. He wants to declare independence for the Iron Islands, but what else does he want? To be able to raid? Yeah. Does he want to claim any extra land? Sometimes, historically, sometimes the Iron Islanders did claim some bits of uh, sort of more mainland Westeros. There was the Harren the Black was an Iron Islander. He took the um, and he was the king of the the Isles and Rivers. That was what he. The title that he claimed, there was a time when Bear Island was taken by the Iron Islanders. So, yes, sometimes they did take bits, but they were always within reach of the coast. And Balon knew that Winterfell, that's not really, that's not really the Iron Islanders. They, they feel that they're away from their god if they're away from the, um, the coast and the water. Um. Questions. Um, okay, let's go back to a question from my uh, patrons. This is uh, Keith Boynton. Uh, hi, Robert. In your view, uh, which of these five is or was the biggest turkey? Uh, I think there's a Thanksgiving link in there. There are some strong contenders, so I'm eager to know your thoughts. Well, I mean, it depends what you mean by turkey. Um, the, the, the fact is, um, if we had to mark all of their cards, Rob did lots of things right and lots of sensible stuff. He won every battle he was in his, his strategic move to split his forces to start with was good. Um, that put them on the front foot. It put Tywin on the back foot, which doesn't happen very often. Um, he his move out into the Westerlands was 
actually quite sensible and could have been strategically vital if he had managed to get Tywin away and if, if Stannis had taken King's Landing, that would have changed everything. Um, so it was just a, a personal honour issue that really uh, lost it for him. And then circumstances beyond his control. So I don't think... I. I think it would be unfair to call him a turkey. I think he he perhaps was a little bit naive at times, and certainly his honour got the better of him when cold political realpolitik would probably have served him better. But, yeah, I, I don't think we can we could be too harsh on, on Rob. And added to which, we never get a POV from Rob, and this is something that George R. Martin has said, that he, he wishes that he could go back and give us a POV from Rob. But... It would be fascinating if we ever did, because when we do see glimpses of him through Bran or through Cat, he seems so unsure of himself. He seems to be always second-guessing himself. He seems to feel the weight of it pressing down on him all the time. And despite all that, he does seem to be trying to do the best he can. And most of the time, he does seem to be doing a reasonable job simply getting all of the northern lords together uh, and supporting him is quite impressive so i don't think we can call him a turkey um uh, stannis well you know he did he did okay but for uh timing beyond his control he would have taken King's landing so again i don't think we can call him a turkey that was just beyond his control renly I mean, he was never to know that he was going to be killed by a shadow baby assassin, and he probably would have. He probably would have uh, got King's Landing. He had the biggest force. He probably would have won. Uh, so again, no Balon. As I say, it's quite hard. It's quite hard to see exactly what he was hoping to gain, other than just independence, and he gained independence, and. So yeah, I suppose he got what he wanted and then he got killed. So it's hard to feel too much about him one way or the other, um, other than the fact he's clearly not a great dad. Um, but Joffrey, did Joffrey do anything good in this? I mean, I don't think anyone's going to disagree if I, if I say that the biggest turkey is Joffrey. He's He did not run the Lannister campaign in any way way shape or form that was done by tywin the, the interventions that he did make were unhelpful executing ned stark hugely unhelpful that pushed it and it made war inevitable it was possible maybe before that it's i mean what if is always a dangerous game to play but the lannisters had ned and sansa captured and the starks had jamie captured um, and for a while they had Tyrion captured. A prisoner swap could have happened. They could have just reached some agreement, maybe. But once Ned was dead, no, that was completely off the table. Nothing nothing was going to happen there. That's why, incidentally, Tywin sent Tyrion down to King's Landing, because he just realised this whole... Uh, Sam, um, Cersei has not got this under control. Uh, Joffrey cannot be trusted. He, despite everything, did did rate and recognise Tyrion's strengths. That's why he sent him down there uh, to take control, because he knew that left to their own devices, they would lose the war on their own, just the two of them there in, in King's Landing, as I suspect we will see with Cersei losing King's Landing when she does get into full control of it in the Winds of Winter. So, um, who's the biggest turkey? Has to has to be uh, Joffrey. It, um, I don't think there's any other way of looking at it. Uh, Sarah, awesome source. Thank you so much. Saying must get back to the family Thanksgiving festivities, but wanted to pop in to contribute to Dan's dog biscuit fund. Thank you so much. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone celebrating, and thank you, moderators. Well, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, moderators. If you're in the chat, please do give them a little bit more love and. Uh, and happy Thanksgiving to you, uh, Sarah. I hope you're having a lovely time with your family. Um, question from 
Uh, Ingun Skielfoss, which I probably completely uh, mispronounced, apologies, uh, saying, Hello, Robert, I have a question regarding Rob and Jane Westerling. I never understood the speculations on whether she is pregnant with his child. Isn't it far more than nine months since he died? At least it feels that way, considering everything we have read since. Um, and also, I can't find the pre-released Ariane chapters from The Winds of Winter. Have you not recorded them? Uh, so this is a patron benefit, just on that second bit. This is a, a benefit for my patrons. as I, I recorded um, audio narrations of the pre-released chapters from The Winds of Winter that we have. They are available to my patrons. Um, I did go back and check this. So I, it turns out I did miss one. Uh, so I do apologize for that. I thought I'd done all of them. Uh, but Ariane, Ariane 1 is definitely there. Ariane 2, um, I think I, if, if I recorded it, I didn't upload it. So I will um, I will re-record that. And that can be... Uh, Christmas bonus or something for my patrons. So I will make sure that that goes up there. Uh, it's a really good chapter, actually. Um, uh, so really looking forward to that one. In terms of your question about Jane Westling and timings, George R. R. Martin is um, a deliberately vague about exact timings. He He's very open and honest about this. He says uh, that partly this is the way that the world operates. They don't have Lots of time pieces. They don't so exact times and dates aren't it's a medieval world. It's not like our modern world. And also, he's he's very open and honest about the fact that if he's a little bit vague, it's actually a lot easier for him because the timelines having to be exactly right um, makes it a lot harder. And also, it adds a little bit to the the plot bits of uncertainty about what exactly is happening when. So. We have that sort of vague uncertainty. Of course, though, there are people who have done um, God's own work and gone through uh, A Song of Ice and Fire and worked out, based on the, the bits of information that we do have um, about uh, when certain events happen in one place and in another and how long it takes to travel from this place to that and when someone's birthday is, things like that. You can pick out... A, a timeline of what happens when give or take a few days a few weeks here and there now if you look at that you will find that the red wedding happened actually in around december of the year 299 ac and so that's when rob died now, he and Jane, he left Jane down in River Run, so it takes a little while to get from River Run, River Run up to uh, uh, the twins. So I mean, maybe maybe a month, give or take. Uh, if he was going particularly hard and fast, maybe he could do it in less time than that. Uh, but that, um, that means... Um, November-ish as the last possible moment for conception. Um, when Jamie takes River Run, it's our best understanding sometime maybe around May the following year. So we're looking at five, six months, something along those lines between the last time Rob and Jane were together and when Jamie captures River Run, which is where Jane is. And at that point, he that's when all of these might she be pregnant? And he takes all of these, um, he, he talks to her mother and, and it becomes apparent that her mother has been making sure that she doesn't become pregnant by uh, uh, feeding her all of these, uh, these uh, drugs in the morning, which she's pretending is to help her become pregnant, but actually it's quite the reverse. So Jamie basically decides to err on the side of caution. Now, I think by six months it would be pretty apparent whether or not she's pregnant she isn't but not everyone was there so it's possible that there could be rumors that going if she has a child a little bit later because the timing's a little bit inexact if she has a child um nine months after that say might people get a bit confused about the exact timings yeah possibly in a time of warfare in particular who knows so he decides to err on the side of caution and say, okay, she's going to be under constant guard now. Um, she's going to go off uh, for 
keep her locked up effectively for two years. There's going to be no chance of her having any children. And leaving that gap two years shows quite how little uh, he's willing to allow anyone to speculate on the idea that any child that she might have is Rob's. So it's not it's not a matter of she is pregnant. It's not a matter of um, it, are we wondering whether or not she might be carrying around the heir to uh, to Winterfell. It's the fact that Jamie wants to be absolutely 100% sure that any baby that does happen at any point is not going to be, everybody can agree, this is definitely not going to be Rob's. So that's that's what's going on there. Uh, Booker T saying they made her drink moon tea uh, anyhow, so it's a moot point. Yeah, absolutely. Um Just have a quick flick through um, Ed's uh, uh, beheaded saying, moment of silence for our dear friend Ned. Yeah, well, all the time. I have to admit, when I'm be I've been doing my reread, um, I just, uh, I got to the, the chapter. It's not the next one I'll do up on Twitter. It'll be one after that. I realized I've been sort of holding back on, on listening to the chapter where, uh, the Aya POV chapter where Ned dies, um, which... Uh, because I just didn't want to do it again. I just it was it just feels so unfair. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's great. It's a great chapter, and it's 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 also just a complete digression. But it's also it's brilliant the way that we don't see this from Ned's perspective. We just we just see it, and so we we never get any kind of like last thoughts from him. This is this is Arya, and we don't even actually see it happen. Um, so this is um, we're, we're distanced from it, and by this point he's had I think fifteen chapters. The next closest I think is probably Cat with about ten chapters. So he is the character who, who has been telling us more of this story than anyone else, and then he's gone, and we don't even we we don't even get to see his last thoughts. And it's like, okay, it's going to be one of those stories, is it? So yeah, it's it's a brilliant bit of writing. Um, uh, Stephen Campbell saying, why do you think the show writers didn't leave the pregnant wife in River Run like the books or vice versa? This is simply because the showrunners were trying to narrow the story down. It's as simple as that. They um, And they did this. They made these decisions all the way through early on. George R. R. Martin talked about the butterfly effects of a lot of these things. If you miss out someone like Fagon, um, early on, that means a huge amount of the the last, what was the last season, will or the last two seasons of Game of Thrones will be very different from what happened in the books because of the ripple effect, because of the butterfly effect. Um, the showrunners were trying to close down as many loose ends and keep things as close as they possibly could to the main storyline. And so as a result, they thought what we don't want is having this extra character running around somewhere in the Riverlands Rob's wife, this is there any chance that she might be pregnant? But that that's that's an extra bit of plot that they just did not want. They wanted the show to remain very streamlined. And so they thought the easiest thing was for her to be killed at the Red Wedding. And it it from their perspective, um then it, it also added to the horror of what happened because um killing her there just added another layer of um, nastiness to it. So, yeah, I, I understand what they were trying to do. It's perhaps, you know, it, obviously it doesn't stick to the books, but I understand why they did that. Uh, Alexandra of Vladimir saying, as a reader, I never missed not getting a Rob POV. Enjoyed uh, his presentation through his siblings, etc. Understand George R. R. Martin wished he did, but Rob doesn't really need more mediation within the books. Yeah, I mean, it works perfectly well without it. I, I completely, under, I, I'm, I'm not going to lobby for the fact that I that he should have had lots. George R. R. Martin didn't give him POV chapters because there was always somebody there to tell his story, whether that's cat or, or bran or whoever we always could see rob's story and we understood where he was coming from what i think when when i say i would love to see a pov is that i think that we or 
I, maybe it's just me, I don't know. I miss that degree of emoting with him as a person in the same way that I emote with all of the other Stark kids. We obviously don't have a Rick on POV, but the other Stark kids, I, I get them, I see where they're coming from. Uh, just seeing him from the outside means that I, we miss that a little bit. Um, James Bremner saying, how much you're asking, how much do you think the War of the Five Kings is written to show that the fate of the small folks' lives don't depend on who is king in the end? Uh, well, quite a lot. The Whether it's to show it doesn't matter who is king in the end, I think definitely George R. R. Martin wants to show us that war, it doesn't matter who's fighting. It doesn't matter which of the nobles are fighting which other nobles. The people who lose are the small folk. They're, they're the people who suffer. We get some great little quotes from people like Varys who, who note this. Um, but George R. R. Martin tells us this story. 95% of this story is told from the perspective of the 1% of the privileged people the people who are brought up in castles as lords and ladies. That's those are those are the eyes we see this story through. And uh through the war, though, occasionally we get to see the the suffering of the small folk. And I think that is one of the things he's trying to show us. As for the the um whether it's to show us it doesn't matter who who rules in the end, I I think it's I think he does think that it matters who rules. I think that he's trying to show us that different rulers are different. Uh, you would rather have Ned Stark rule than Joffrey. I think that he's trying to do that. In terms of who, who does it matter who's king in the end, I think he's trying to show that it does matter, but the person who is the best does not necessarily end up there. I think we'll see Fagon will come out looking really quite good as if he is actually, as Varys and Illyria had planned, Good, right and trained to be a monarch, a good monarch, and actually probably would do a good job, but he's not going to survive. Um, question from uh, Reflective Rambling, or picking up something for John uh, Siriani. Uh, what might have been done if Arya was discovered at Harrenhal? Sent back to King's Landing to keep the sisters together, or is there a better option? Um, so, well, I suppose it depends on who discovers her. If this is uh, Roos Bolton, then um, we we know that Roos's plan eventually turned out in order to legitimise his claim to Winterfell was to marry Ramsay to fake Arya. That, so that was his plan, because he he knew that people would when there were definitely there were starks out there somewhere uh, yes they got destroyed and everybody thought that bran and rickon were dead uh john is obviously up at the wall having disavowed any affiliations rob is definitely dead uh, sansa and arya as far as everyone's concerned are still out there now in order for him to claim the some sort of right to Winterfell, he had to marry into the Starks and also to prevent them from marrying other people. This incidentally was why Tywin uh, got Sansa to marry Tyrion because he discovered the plot to get Sansa to be marrying into the Tyrells and he realised that if Sansa was married into the Tyrells that would give the Tyrells a claim to the North and he couldn't possibly allow that, so he had to make sure that Sansa was married off to Tyrion so that the the Starks had no claim, no one else had any claim to the North. So I think if Roos Bolton had discovered her, then he would have taken her up, and instead of creating a fake Arya, he would have used the real Arya uh, to semi-legitimise his, his claim to Winterfell. Um... Okay, let's go with a 
question from um, Lawn Duck 20 saying, Hello, Robert. It's Thanksgiving here in the US, uh, so I won't be able to watch live. Um, but in your opinion, what do you think? Uh, happy Thanksgiving to you, by the way, Lawn Duck 20. Um, what do you think triggered the War of the Five Kings? Was it one singular event that happened, like Catelyn taking Tyrion, or was it a combination of multiple events? Um, so I started my overview of what happened in the War of the Five Kings by saying that the trigger was cat capturing Tyrion. And that is true. That is, that is the first point at which you can say that is what caused somebody to raise an army to attack. So you, you can point at that as being the trigger. From that moment on, Tywin felt as if he had to attack the Riverlands and that created a war. So that is definitely there. But at the same time, there would have been a war anyway, because the firstly, the Lannisters were on a very long power grab, and they were they were going to at some point they were going to try and claim the throne. And the Baratheons were always going to contest this. Once Stannis had become convinced that the 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 three technical Baratheon children, uh, Joffrey, Tom, and Marcella, were not actually Baratheons, but Lannisters. Once he became convinced of that, he would be convinced that he is the rightful king, and we know what Stannis is like. He would have attacked. So there was always going to be a war. From that moment on, the moment that Stannis knew, there was always going to be a war. Uh, and so... The trigger there is Stannis discovering um, the truth. Now, as I say, it's not, it's it's one of those things, and it's the same with Robert's Rebellion, is that you can pick out specific trigger points, but at the same time, you have to accept that the the way that the world was, some there was always going to be a trigger. It did it was just a matter of what that trigger was. The 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 situation was such that war was going to happen at some point. There was no real way around it. There were so many grudges between different people that it, it was going to happen. So I I put the, the main trigger as Cat taking Tyrion because that is the first army that's being formed as a result of an action. But you could pick a number of other things if you... Uh, if you wish. Um, Damon Snow, the Kelpie of Winterfell, saying, Hi, Robert. One time after your stream, an idea came to me. What exactly did Rob's campaign in the West? Could her, the Boltons have stopped the Lannisters from reaching the Tyrells and um, capturing uh, uh, Tywin after Edmure did his thing? I'm sorry if I annoy you with my what ifs, but I hope you're doing well with Dan. Uh, by the way, you are my headcanon of Larry Strong. Oh, well, thank you. Um, uh, very, very kind two Super Chats. Thank you. Uh, I do appreciate that. So, Bruce, what was Bruce doing while Rob was heading off into the West? Could he have stopped the Lannisters? Well, he was trying at that point, as George R. Martin said, he was trying to... Um, just keep all of his options open for as long as he possibly could. He, the, the Boltons have always wanted to take over the North, and this was potentially a chance. So could he have been helpful and try and take... Going down and attacking Tywin's force in Harren Hall would not have worked. Could he have um, tried to help out by outflanking, as appeared to have been um, Edmure's plan, uh, to outflank them and sort of squeeze them against the river. Yeah, he could have done, and that could have done good things, but he increasingly, Roos Bolton, was starting to do things that were um, sapping the strength of the Starks rather than aiding the Starks. And now we talked a bit earlier about um, 
that chapter, the Arya chapter, when he sends some troops down to Duskendale. I didn't really expand on that, but that's actually another really important point when he is he doesn't declare anything, but his actions show that he's made up his mind. So he sends a, a set of troops over to Duskendale, and the troops that he chooses are Stark loyalist troops. And he sends them over to Duskendale. So he's keeping in in Harren Hall close to him. He's got his own troops. He's got the phrase. There are still some Stark loyalists, but he sends the bulk of them off to take Duskendale. Now, he does this by pretending that this is orders from Rob. It, it's not. Taking Duskendale is one of those things that if, if it had happened, then great. They've gained another quite important place, a strategically important place. This is the port, quite a big important port. But was it needed for the war? No, not at all. And what actually happened was that he was sending them into a trap because Randall Tarley was there. And we know Randall Tarley, excellent general. He was there and he had a huge force and he defeated them. So just some of them managed to escape back. So this was basically him sending a whole load of Stark troops to their death. Then when he headed back up north, what he did was he deliberately arranged his troops so that his guys and the Freys were in the front and the people at the back were the Stark loyalists. This was important because he knew that the mountain and the mountain's force, small army, were going to come and attack them from the rear. So when they came and attacked, a lot more Stark loyalists died. His people were safe. Then this was near the Ruby Ford. And then he says, oh, OK, so just to, to make sure this doesn't happen again, they managed to push uh, the mountain's forces back. Make sure this doesn't happen again. I'm going to leave some forces here garrisoning the Ruby Ford. And the people that he left were the Stark loyalists. And so by the time he's headed back up to uh, the twins, actually, he's managed to get rid of all of the Stark loyalists. He's just going with his own troops and with the phrase. And this, as I say, this is the kind of thing that you don't pick up on on a first read through because you don't know what he's about to do. But then when you go back through it, you realise, ah, actually, yeah, he's he's very cleverly just trying to get rid of all the Stark loyalists, weaken the Starks all the way through. So could he have done, in terms of your question, could he have uh, done um, some good to stop the Lannisters, to hurt the Lannisters? Yes, he could. But he decided not to because that his his plan was to play on both sides for as long as he could and until he uh, had to make a decision, until it was obvious which side was win was going to win and then go with them. And that that incidentally is very much the free approach to life is that they just hold back and hold back and hold back until they know who's going to win and then they join that side. So that's how he found some natural allies with the phrase. Um, Kai Johnson saying, could I give a shout out to Ethan, please? Hi, Ethan. Um, question, <laughs> Darth Griff saying, oh, I misread this. I thought it was the Battle of the Five Armies. It's not, no, but um, uh, I did do a video on the Battle of the Five Armies. If you want a breakdown of actually what happened in the battle in the books, um, because it's, it's written in a very concise style by Tolkien, big digression, written in a very concise style by Tolkien, but the, he does describe all of the troop movements. So if you're interested in what actually happened there, they turned it into a film, into a whole film. Not, not really what happened in the books. So if you want to know what happened in the books, do go and check that one out. Um, Let's go. Oh, and Lawn Duck 20 also said, I just watched the episode in the show when Balon tells Asher he won the war because the other four kings were dead. But in the book, Stannis is the last one standing. So as a Stannis fan myself, this means he technically won the War of the Five Kings, right? If that's what if, that, if, if it's just a matter of last king standing, then yes, yes, uh, you can say that Stannis did. Uh, from my perspective stannis 
gave up on that war after the defeat in the Battle of the Blackwater. He gave up on that war and went to fight another war up in the north. That doesn't mean he's given up on getting the Iron Throne. Not by a long shot. But that specific war, the War of the Five Kings, um, although it didn't have a specific end date, I think the moment that you've got four dead kings and the fifth has effectively exited that theatre and gone all the way to the far north to engage with uh, wildlings and the others, that, I think, is the end of the war. Yes, he survived, but the winners were the Lannisters. Um, Catherine Furseth saying... Uh, hi, Robert. Thanks, as always, for bringing light and entertainment to our Thursday evenings. I wonder about the allegiance of the Reach, led by the Tyrells. Put oversimplified, during Robert's rebellion, they seemed to try to stay out of it as much as they could, even though Randall Tarly led his army against Robert in his only defeat. What do you think their strategic thinking was when Robert died and several contenders emerged for the throne? It can't have been so simple as making Marjorie queen. Was it securing influence on the throne? Their actions seem more forward-leaning than during Robert's Rebellion. What is your view? Yes, so their actions are much more forward-leaning than during Robert's Rebellion. During Robert's Rebellion, basically, yes, they just bunked out of it. They could have had a huge uh, influence on this, but they decided not to. They, uh, For those who missed my Robert's Rebellion videos, or I, last, I think last live stream when I was doing a Song of Ice and Fire, I was talking about Robert's Rebellion. The Robert Baratheon himself and his forces were heading across, trying to join up with their allies, and their only defeat in the war was when the Tyrell forces, or more specifically, Randall Tarly with his forward force, defeated him. But then uh, Mace... Uh, decide Mace Tyrell decided not to chase after Robert, just to let him go, and instead to head off and besiege Storm's End. This is one of those things that looks like it's you can't argue against it. Storm's End. This was the hereditary home of the Baratheons. Uh, Robert Baratheon was leading the, um, the 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 fight, the rebellion. So yes, it's a strategic target but it is away from the war. And going all the way over there with all of their army and all of their navy was basically them saying, we're not taking a part in this war. This absolutely smacks of Elena Tyrell just saying, we'll wait and see who wins, and we'll keep roughly the same position we had beforehand. That's what was going on there. So that's the history. Why was it different this time when Robert Baratheon died? Because... I think two reasons. The first is that during uh, Robert's Rebellion, they didn't really have a link in with anywhere, the Tyrells. They were largely keeping to themselves. Um, they, they weren't married into any of the other families. There was no strong links. So they weren't natural allies with anyone. When it came to this, the War of the Five Armies, then... It, we get the War of the Five Kings, sorry, uh, thinking back to the Battle of the Five Armies, the War of the Five Kings, then we have a link because we have Loras Tyrell, who is the lover of Renly. And it is him who, it would appear, started putting these thoughts into Renly's head about he could be king. And so there we already have a link. The, the Tyrells have somebody to back. They've got a horse to back this time. And the the fact is that they they could should have won this. Actually, when you add up the armies, Renly's army he had plus the Tyrells that were there came apparently to eighty thousand. This is massive. This is much bigger than uh, Rob Stark's army of maybe twenty thousand. Much bigger than the Lannister army of. Depends on, on where you listen to 30 odd thousand, maybe, maybe double that. Uh, but it's spread out. This was 80,000 there, plus probably another 20,000 still in the reach. This is easily the biggest army. And but for Renly being killed, they would have won. 
I don't think there's much doubt in that at all. They would have uh, they would have swept all before them, and they would have taken the throne. Now, the the strategy, interestingly enough, and again, this this kind of does smack of someone like Elen and Lena Tyrell because it's cleverer than it looks like at first glance. Because Renly, having amassed his army, he's only two weeks from King's Landing. And he just really slowly kind of meanders his way towards it. They stop, they hang around for a bit. They have a, he's choosing his, his King's guard. Um, he, he has some, a few feasts. He gets married. He, he doesn't seem in any rush at all to actually get to King's Landing, which in a civil war is a little bit odd, but it seems that the cunning plan is that he's going to go slowly because he wants the Lannisters and the Starks to be fighting each other. He wants them to be destroying each other so that he could, he can, they can um, uh, reduce each other's numbers. He can swan in after that's all finished, take King's Landing, and then come to some agreement with Rob Stark. That's that's the plan, and it should have worked. As I say, if if Stannis did not have a big enough force to defeat Renly, if Melisandre hadn't been there, if Shadow Baby Assassins hadn't been there, Stannis would have been, probably his army would have been destroyed and then he would probably have been captured by Renly and Renly's army would have taken King's Landing. That is the most likely outcome. So why did the Tyrells get involved this time? Because they had a personal connection and somebody to back and because they thought they would win and they were probably right. Uh, Kai Johnson uh, with a super chat that says message redacted. Um, if there was a question there, then um, um, then I'm sure one of my moderators will pick it up in the chat. Um, let's go to a question from. Um, oh well, actually, this one. It's probably going to be a slightly shorter than usual live stream because because uh, it is Thanksgiving. Um, I've got a couple more questions for my patrons, uh, but I'm going to try and pick up as many um, uh, as many different questions as I can in the chat. Uh, Gabriel Farrell saying, "Hi, Robert. Do you think there was ever any chance of Rob winning, surviving, and gaining the North once Stannis lost, or even when Renly died?" Many blame it on his marriage to Jane, which admittedly was a dumb move and possibly orchestrated by Tywin. But as we read in the Arya chapters, Roos and the phrase were already, uh, but um, already losing faith before this. Could he have just gone back, retaken Winterfell, and sealed the neck, or was it all doomed as soon as he went south? Well, I don't, I don't think it's fair to say it was all doomed from the moment he headed south. The, the the window for victory and is the mirror of what I've just been talking about with Renly, which is Rob was wanting to pull Tywin away so that Renly or Stannis later could take King's Landing. That's that's the plan. So uh, for both of them were thinking that Renly slash Stannis takes king's landing then rob agrees some kind of deal and then they head he heads back north so that's that's the general plan and it could have worked as we've already noted it could well have worked if if tywin had headed further west he wouldn't have got message in time he wouldn't have been able to save king's landing from stannis so it could easily have worked uh, was was there a chance after after the battle of the blackwater uh, once the Tyrells and the Lannisters were victorious in the south, was there any chance for them? Well, if he'd turned back straight away, headed north, um, possibly. Uh, Bruce Bolton had not yet made up his mind. The, the, the chain of events that seems to have influenced Bruce Bolton to change his mind and actually throw his support properly behind the Lannisters' phrase is... The Rob's marriage breaking the Frey uh, relationship, the Battle of the Blackwater, that those things together seem to have been the 
the, the turning point. And until then, yes, Roos was probably not to be trusted, but he had not he had not turned. So it was possible at that point. Until then, it was possible for Rob to, tu- Rob to turn around and go back. But I don't think he ever would. This is a character-driven story. Rob was very, as I said earlier, he was very aware of what other people thought of him. And is that a thing that a king would do? He's a, he's amassed from his perspective. He's amassed this army in the north to take it down south, which is not a thing that the northerners do huge amounts of the time because they killed his father. So he goes down there, and then what happens? He gets he he has a few battles. He wins battles. He doesn't lose a single battle, and then he gives up and goes back home. No, I don't think Rob would ever have done that. He only went back once. Winterfell was gone. And that's the point at which, um, and once the Lannisters were secure in the south, that's the point at which he basically was admitting defeat and heading back up north. Until that moment had come, I don't think, I don't think he would have done it. Uh, John Martin saying, no question, to this. thanks for the great content. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. Um, uh, uh, reflective rambling picking up i th- assume this is the the super chat uh saying he asked if you would do a video on rob stark on whether rob stark could have won the war of the five kings um what's well, a good question it's, it's something i've thought about a few times one of the my favorite lord of the rings videos i did was uh, i did a series a breakdown of the war of the ring which is the war which is raging in the background of the story that we read in the lord of the rings there are lots of battles that we don't really see but they're going on in the background so what's the strategy and what was actually happening i really enjoyed doing that and i have considered doing something similar for the war of the five kings so maybe um, I, I don't whether I would do it as a could Rob have won. I mean, maybe. Uh, so watch this space is what I think what I'm saying. It's uh, I, I've I, I'm still creating videos on uh, on a song of ice and fire. I suspect obviously next year we'll start transitioning a little bit more into House of the Dragon stuff. So Dance of the Dragons, Fire and Blood. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm. It, it's something I've definitely thought of. Um, uh, okay, question um, from, this is my last patron question, Lady of Summer, will the Riverlands ever catch, oh, this is not it's been my penultimate one, this is a quick one, will the Riverlands ever catch a break, Lady of Summer? No, is the short answer. This is This is something which happens every war the people who bear the brunt of it are the riverlands and um maybe actually uh let's see whether i can get that um oh, I've, i left the picture up i've only just noticed all this time the picture has been up uh the map the so if you look at this map this is a map of the center of westeros the riverlands is the bit in the middle this means it is inevitable that if there is a war, any kind of civil war, the Riverlands will bear the brunt of it. Because the North has only one border with the rest of the Seven Kingdoms, and that's with the Riverlands. The the Vale of, of Arryn has only one border with the rest of land border with the rest of the Seven Kingdoms, and that's with the Riverlands. Um, the, the Westerlands has only two borders, one of them is with the Riverlands reach two borders. One of them is or maybe three technically, but you've got a mountain range with Dawn. Um, and again, everyone borders. It's like they're the middle bit of the jigsaw and everything links into it. So if anyone is going to attack anyone else, they have to go through the Riverlands. And it is, it's good terrain for fighting. It's flat. It's not, um, it's not the mountainous land. So you, just having, you know, you, you can't just sort of, have local knowledge and uh, work your way through it uh, on the basis of and win on the basis of how much you know about your local area. That's not how it works. It's just largely flat, low lying with some big rivers running through it. So will they ever catch a break? No. As long as there are wars in uh, the Seven Kingdoms, in Westeros, the Riverlands will always 
get the worst of it. Uh, Diego Godoy saying hello. Also, hola, Robert. Hola. Uh, how much do you blame Edmure for his strategic mistake during the war when he didn't follow Rob's orders? I mean, he didn't know what Rob really intended or if the plans had changed. So I feel like he's not really to blame there. Thanks. Yeah, so I covered this a little bit earlier on. Um, but just to give this a bit of context, we've got um, Rob, who's headed off into the Westerlands. He's gone off. He's uh, tempting, trying to tempt Tywin out from Harren Hall off into the Westerlands, hoping that this will mean that Stannis will be able to attack King's Landing. That's the cunning plan. So he wants. Tywin to be heading west. The, the orders that he leaves with Edmure are just to stay there, don't engage. But Edmure then suddenly sees things have changed. Things have uh, have moved on. And, um, the, and Tywin is moving his army to go and attack Rob. So Edmure decides to stop Tywin from crossing in in a really good position. There's one good position to take on Tywin in the Riverlands, try to stop him from crossing the river. And so he does that. Is he to blame for this because he didn't kind of just stick at home? I mean, it's hard to blame him completely. And he did do a good job. He did stop Tywin from crossing over. He wasn't to know that that delay would then change the course of the war. That was that was definitely not on him. And he wasn't to know that Roose Bolton was being a little bit wobbly and therefore wasn't going to really help it by attacking from uh, behind. So, again, that's not really his fault. Should should he technically have just done exactly what he was told and just sit in River Run, sit on his hands and not doing any, do anything? Well, yes, but at the same time, you want your commanders to be able to think on their feet. And this does seem to be a, a reasonable thing for him to do. So I find it hard to blame him for this. I think this is, he gets a bad rep. He deserves a bad rep for the vast majority of the time here. He was I mean, not great. He probably shouldn't have, but he did. A, he did it. What would have probably been worse if he'd gone out there and then mucked it up. Um, <laughs> but he actually went out there and succeeded in what he was trying to do. So I, I have to give him some credit for that. Uh, reflective rambling uh, from Stephen Campbell saying, is there a particular battle you would have liked to see on paper? Um, uh, it was an interesting question. I, I mean, there, there are lots. So George R. R. Martin doesn't give us many battles in the heat of the battle because we're seeing it from people's perspectives. Um, so things like the Battle of the Blackwater are actually the exception when we, I think we get something like half a dozen chapters devoted to it because we've got different characters there and we can see their uh, point of view. And so Tyrion actually going out and doing fighting, that's, relatively rare what we more often have are things like and and i think it was, again it was a great chapter when we get a catlin chapter seeing the battle of the whispering wood that i think works really well so we don't actually see the battle we just hear the reports coming back we suddenly see some people charging to and fro on the horses uh, and we just have cat who's there basically with her on a guard around her, they're waiting to see who wins. If they lose, they're going to escort her straight back up north. Uh, but they don't lose. And so she sees um, everybody coming back afterwards and she hears their tales. And so we don't see the battle, but it's really well done. So the majority of the time, I don't actually mind that we don't see the battles. I think um, one thing, just I mentioned it, briefly the battle of duskendale has always fascinated me because of the fact it's it's not strategically important at all but it's the 
when actually seeing Randall Tarly in battle as this great commander, we're told again and again how amazing he is. I, I think it would be really interesting to see how he does that. Where How does he set his troops up? Where, how do they win this battle? Uh, how does he spring the trap? And from the other side, the Stark loyalist side, what do they actually think when they go there? They're probably confused by the orders to start with, and then they suddenly discover that Ooh, there's an army here we weren't expecting. Do any of them go, hang on a moment, why are we here? Is this, is Bruce Bolton really been being straight and honest with us? So both sides there I would be fascinated to see. And the other, I think, is the Battle of the Mammoth Ford for obvious reasons, because we read about it, we hear about it, um, but this is, it was a short, it's a small battle, it's a skirmish really more than anything else, but it's the first time when Beric Dondarrion comes back from the dead. And as I've said many times, this is the prime example of the exception proving the rule about having to have um, uh, certain things in order for magic to work. And, and the things being uh, intentionality specifically, um, that that doesn't seem to be there at all. Normally, magic seems to need some kind of intentionality. This didn't. So those are the two um, that I would uh, I would go with. Um, uh, Rob Star the King saying D and D are the worst guys in TV history. Um, well, I'm not going to get into that, but I, I, I can. I, all I will say is that if you watch the first four seasons, and if you if you are a part of this the Game of Thrones community in the first four seasons, then the complete opposite view was uh, predominant. Everybody thought that they were brilliant. So uh, I think we have to have some kind of balance in this. Um, is that yes, I have many views on season eight, but I think we have to recognise the fact that to start with. The reason why we love this so much is because of the fantastic work that happened, not just from them, but across the piece, uh, particularly early on in Game of Thrones. Reflective Rambling uh, saying, if Ned had refused the hand, would he have gone to war for the North? Uh, subsequently, if Rob was left in Winterfell, uh, would they have had a better chance? Um, uh, P.S. Enjoy your post stream uh, Wheel of Time and Wine. Yes, I'm this is my new tradition. I'm going to, after my live streams, I'm going to watch the Wheel of Time, which is probably going to be dropping about the time that I finish this live stream. Um, so if Ned had refused to be Hand of the King, would he have gone to war for the North? Um, uh, I'm, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm trying to work out if Robert had sort of stormed off back down South, probably not. If Ned would have stayed up there. If Rob was left in Winterfell, would they have had a better chance? Um, yeah, so I think one of the things I would say about who's left up in Winterfell is it's it becomes very obvious. Rob wanted a big, a hastily assembled big army to head down south, which he got and he needed, but that left, it's very obvious Bran chapter after Bran chapter, he's there. Even and Bran's just a child, but even he looks out over the training ground and goes, "All that's left up here are they're not soldiers." So the fact that Winterfell was completely gutted lends itself to this idea that there was a um. Uh, complacency is probably the best way of saying this about the safety of the North. They, we, we get this so many times about Moat Kaelin. We, we, it's, it's got this great mythology about Moat Kaelin and how they're always talking about how it can't be attacked. It's thrown back armies hundreds of times who are trying to invade the North. No one's ever going to get into the North. Um, Moat Kaelin changes hands two, three times, probably will change hands more times in the story. Um, it's not, it's not all that. It's not, it once was, but it's not now. And Winterfell is Winterfell completely um, protected and there's no one can ever, well, clearly no. Theon, with a very small force, managed to take Winterfell. So there was a complacency going on in the North. 
that we're safe. We're, we're so far apart from everywhere else. No one will ever attack us. That, I think, was the biggest issue. Whether Rob was there or not, I don't think makes makes the difference. It wasn't the... Um, it wasn't the general ship. It was the the, the lack of um, understanding of how actually people could attack us. Um, question, let's go and uh, quickly, I'm going to pick up on as many different things in the chat as I can. Um, Stephanie Frederick saying, I watched the first three episodes of Wheel of Time with my daughter. We need to watch the next one. Um, uh, Carl Karsnak saying uh, the showrunners and Game of Thrones were great as long as they had the books to guide them, but without them, they were just aimless and got bored and lazy. Producers aren't authors. Um, I think that's a view shared by many. Uh, Kai Johnson asking, how could the Ironborn have been persuaded to join forces with another king during the War of the Five Kings? I don't think they could. I think Balon Greyjoy just wanted independence for the Iron Islands. He didn't want to ally with anyone else. Um, uh, Mark uh, Scheisser, is that your name? Um, I would like to uh, read more about the battles between the Cranagmen and the Freys and Lannisters. Um, well, anything to do with the Cranagmen, I would love to hear more about. Um, um, Grizzly Meadows saying the Trident, we need a proper account of that battle. The Battle of the Trident in Robert's Rebellion, absolutely. Um, Stephen Campbell saying I would have loved to read about the first battle between the Mountain and Don Darian. Yes, so um, uh, I, I would agree uh, that. Um, Wingy saying audio quality has improved since I last watched your live stream. I'm very pleased to hear that. I've I've been trying my best on the audio quality to be uh, to be upping it uh, each time. I haven't seen anyone in the chat say that there's been dips. That's been the problem couple of times recently uh but i've been uh, trying a few different things so hopefully that now works um uh, bogdan matash saying i wonder how things would have turned out if Arya had uh, would have gotten her names right and actually got tywin killed yeah so she had the opportunity uh to cause some real damage um but she didn't which um, yeah, would it have made a difference if Tywin had been killed at that point? Well, yes, the Lannisters would have. We, we see the Lannisters collapse when Tywin's not there. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's that def definitely that would have changed things completely. Um, the, the War of the Five Kings was won, I would argue, not so much on the battlefield as by Tywin's. Um, alliances and negotiations behind the scenes so the we all know obviously with the the dealings with the phrase uh, and the boltons and that clearly changed the war there but also his deal with the tyrells massively important that completely changed the balance of power in the south um it was him managing to um gain the right alliances with the right people at the right times, which tipped the balance. He he was, we, we may not think he was, he's not a nice character. He's, he's a horrible character, but he is probably the most competent character out of the entire war. Um, uh, Carl Eason saying, so glad I caught this. Well, I'm we're starting to come to the end uh, now, unfortunately. Um, um, let's... Uh, Mark uh, Sh uh, Shisa um, uh, yes that's it uh, I actually I do know I know that I apologize for I'm entirely mispronouncing your name um, so and Johnny Skinwalker saying I feel like the show should have done more with Beric yeah they could definitely have um, done more okay so let's I think with that I will start to uh, let me move that and I'll bring me back up again. Uh, so next week I'm going to um, start on uh, a new series. I think by the, we've, we've drawn to a close, I think. On, I've been working our way through the history here of, 
of Westeros, and we're pretty much up to the, the, the present day in the books now. So I decided what I will do is I'm going to shift gear a little bit, and we're going to start thinking. I asked my uh, my patrons what they would like me to be focusing in on, um, and again, this is another patron benefit. If you're interested in being a patron, link down in the description somewhere. Um, I asked my patrons what they would like live streams to be on in the future. And uh, the the general feel was uh, that they would like to be focusing in on characters from the Dance of the Dragons. So this is a preparation for House uh, House of the Dragon when it comes through. Uh, we're going to be looking, first of all, I think, at Daemon Targaryen, who is an amazing character. Uh, so really looking forward to that. So that is what is going to be coming up next. Uh, Wingy, just saying, take my money. Thank you very much. I hugely appreciate that. Um, uh, so, uh, I think if you are, uh, if you're interested in watching more of these live streams, there will be a link appearing somewhere up around here. If you're watching back later, if you would like to support this channel, the very best way to do that is by clicking on this link here. It will take you to Patreon. Fantastic site. Okay. Uh, I think that's all for this time. Uh, I will be back this time next week. Take care, everyone. And I'll see you again soon.